Hello, everybody, and welcome to the fifth in our special series of podcasts discussing Cox Automotive, Grant Thornton's Insight Report. I'm Philip Nothard, Insight Director at Cox Automotive, and I have the pleasure of being joined today by Dale Wyatt, Director of Suzuki in the UK and Ireland. Hi, Dale. How's um, 2024 going? Shaping up, I think. I think we're we're, we're battling with the, the wrap-up in the setup, Phil. So we're trying to close off last year and set up the new year. We're 16 days in. Halfway through the month already, time flies, doesn't it? Excellent, excellent. Well, thanks for, for joining us today. So, as I say, in this series, we're going to be discussing the topics and the headlines found in the recent Insight Report, which you can read on the Cox Automotive website. In this podcast, we will focus on the dealer sector, drilling down on the challenges and opportunities dealers face in the wake of a change in retail dynamics and economic uncertainty. So, I'll get off with a few big questions, Dale, just to get this conversation going. And 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 you know, I I obviously do follow everything you put out on on social media, and we we personally chat on a regular basis. But you know, as another year gets underway, and we're just saying there, we you know, early days of twenty twenty four. I mean, what are the biggest challenges and and operationally and financially facing car dealerships? Do you think in the UK this year? Well, I think there are a number of things. I think the first thing is events. I think um, every year you have events that have an impact, and we've got a number of things that could hit us. You've got the Suez Canal, you've got Israel, Ukraine, Taiwan, Trump, the football Euros, and the elections all to contend with. So all of those things are going to are going to have a varying impact on on the year. And um, and I'm not sure who the politician was, but somebody once said events, dear boy, events. And I think um, I think when, when when you look at that list, there's a there's a, there's lots of opportunity for lots of events and lots of disruption in the year. So I think that's the first thing for that. And then secondly, I think you've got the market dynamics. You've got the whole used residual value issue. I think you've got the shortage of three to seven year old used cars will begin to have an impact on the marketplace. I think it'd be interesting to see what happens to, to early generation one EVs. I think they could be quite undesirable. I think we'll see um, internal combustion engine supply tighten up in the second half of the year. And I think the big question is, are consumers ready for EVs? At the moment, one in 11 choose an EV. And we need to get that to be, to, be, to be two out of 10. So a big increase in EV adoption. And then you've got volume pressures in a push market. And you've got all of those things that we're not used to around targets, tactical opportunities, risk and rewards. And we'll soon be talking about back page costs, stocking costs and storage costs. will soon become things on the agenda. And the other thing for me is around people, Philip. I think um, a lot of people have forgotten or haven't got the muscle memory of how to perform in a push market, a market where you've got to create activity rather than manage activity. And um, you've got to reward the right behaviours. And we've got a bit of um, what I call post-COVID coziness. And things are a bit tougher now. And uh, I think we're all used to a slightly gentler life. So I think the key thing about it would be about how we survive in a market that punishes inactivity and rewards cons consistent proactivity. And um, I think I think it's about getting the right people on the bus in the right seats, doing the right things, and being really clear about what it is you want. So long answer there, Philip. But I think I think it's kind of events, the market, people, and surviving in a push market are the are the key things that I think are important. And do you think? I mean, you know, we talk about that return to a push market from very much a pull market which is the, the market that we're in in the, the post pandemic and you know we're on about get your running shoes back on and to people and get back to that selling rather than order taking kind of an environment and we know that kind of changed part way through 2023 but you know we are now fully like you say in that that back to a selling marketplace with push product with lots of different dynamics playing out yeah i think if you and look at the number of vehicles that are in storage at the moment we, we, i think we're looking at empty car parks and now we're looking at full car parks so there's there's plenty of supply around and um there'll be pockets of oversupply and i mean i know you well and i know how much time you spend talking to your dealer network yeah on a regular basis you know it's there's there's not a day go by that you don't have some kind of conversation with your dealer network be it directly or through 
any of your social channels or, or events and things like this, but what advice would you give dealers hoping to remain competitive and to get them through some of these challenges that you listed before in 2024? Because there's a lot for, we know the sector is very resilient. We've proven that over the decades. You know, we always get through some of these bigger events, but 2024 is a year where there is lots of external factors taking place that are out of the dealer's control, many of them. What advice are you giving the dealers and what advice can you give the dealers to navigate through through this year? Well, I think I think you use the word control and control the controllables is the first thing. Um, but uh, but, I, but I've, been, I've been thinking a lot about mindset and um, the reality is how you feel about it has nothing to do with the fact that you have to do it. I think we've all got a get around to it list in our mind. I must get around to that. And the get around to it list becomes a do it now list. I think um, those things you've been putting off, you really need to get to get on, get on with now. And um, there's a story that I tell her. I remember, I remember years ago going to watch my daughter in a play. My daughter trained to be an actress, and the play was called Things I Know to Be True. And halfway through the play, I looked down at the program and saw this, saw the title Things I Know to Be True, and got my pen out and started writing on the program things that I knew to be true about Suzuki that needed to fix. Well, wife spotted me and I had to quickly put the pen away, but um, I got some education on the way back, Philip. But I think the message is we know what needs to be done. It's just putting yourself in neutral and getting on with it. Um, and I think moving forward, being customer centric is going to be really important. And there is room to be different. And I don't think, I, I think too many people follow the crowd. When you look at the market, there are close to 40 brands in the UK now, hundreds of products and thousands of places to buy. You've got no bad cars. We've got plenty of businesses delivering bad experiences. So I think it's about getting your core process right and really focusing on your core process right. Letting your people shine and doing the basics brilliantly. So, so, um, you, yeah. so it's, yes, it is, it is fundamentally back down to that people and process. The, the, the you know, the, the, the back in the early days and, you know, we won't show our age on this. Dale, but um, the three P's was always something I was brought up with in my my career. That people, price, process. You know, get all the the three right, and and you should have a fairly successful business. And the back to basics comment is is always thrown in there, isn't it? I think so. I think I think um, I'd like Suzuki people to be people that know their stuff and do as they say. There's some 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 blunt talking there, but kind of um, be the experts in your area. And do what you say you're going to do. And um, I've got a view that a lot of people are managed and underled. I think the temptation is to get get right in amongst the detail, and you end up suffocating the managers if you're not careful. And to the leaders out there, I would say the key thing to do is to create your plan, communicate your plan, get the business behind the plan, and then execute it. And um, and I think it's easy to get tempted into kind of getting involved in doing the sales manager's job or the service manager's job. And the, and the first thing to do as a leader is to do your job. So, so, so by the sounds of it, then it sounds like 2024 is there's and and as always, and I think we we did this through the pandemic, and it's never any different to a degree. But focus on what you can control. You know, focus on your people. Make sure the people in their roles are doing the jobs that they are there to do focus on their roles and, and to lead, not managed, but to, to lead the business through. Yeah, exactly. So, so it's down to you to create your plan, to, to get everyone behind the plan, then to execute it. And um, all to it's very easy to get tempted into kind of running your sleeves up and and, and, and getting in the way of the management team and becoming a blocker rather than an enabler. And the big question, and you and I have, had many conversations about this across the sector and we we can't have a conversation there without talking about the the agency model and you know in in your view what does the arguable, arguable lack of clarity about the agency sales model suggest about agency because clearly you know what was talked about number of years ago about the onset of agency and the early adopters and when it was being spoke about isn't what is starting to to play out and 
you know, we're seeing a lot of different agency kind of models, different, you know, variations of it and things like that. But in your view, you know, what, what is the, you know, what, what do we need to clarify about agency modeling and, and what's your view on the, the whole move to agency at the minute? Well, I think, I mean, the best parallel I can give you, Philip, is if you think about, if you're looking to build a house, there's two ways you can build a house. You can have a design and build, or you can have a, or you can have a project. If you've got a project, you've got a fixed cost, every element costed, you're clear about what the materials are, you're clear about what time you need, you've got a timetable with a known budget and a known timeline. That's the way you, one way to build a house. The other way to build a house is hire an architect of an unknown cost, broad assumptions of a rough design, be not clear about the ROI looks like, and hope for the best. And if you get a brilliant architect, maybe you can get something that's a house that'll be, be stunning. But often the challenge is if you change the architect, you end up with a problem. And uh, I think, and there's some things that are attractive, but we haven't costed it. There isn't a, a timeline, and we're not really sure of where the costs are. And, and, a, and an example I was thinking of is if you think about the difference between HS2 and the Olympic Games or the coronation, HS2 is a kind of a, a, an ethereal project with some, some benefits. Um, whereas whereas um, the Olympic Games or the coronation are things that we're brilliant at as a country. We get the experts, we've got a definitive timeline, you can't miss the timeline. And we're brilliant at it. So I think um, agencies is a, is a design and build project rather than a, a proper fixed project. And I think that causes problems, especially when you've got moving characters, moving actors, and you've got different people, different views coming into the business. And and um, yeah, so th there's a there's a an analogy for you, Philip. I think it, I think it works. So well, so where that leaves it is you've got dealers that are procrastinating, bit of caution, bit of toe in the water, on the fence, wait and see, not fully committed. Whereas with the franchise model, whether you like it or not, if you're in, you're all in. You've invested, you've clear your rose responsibility, you've got to test the business model, and there is an interdependency. So I think um, as problems emerge on the agency model, you have to kind of review rose responsibilities. So we started off, the manufacturer will do the marketing, or oh, maybe we need some dealer marketing. And there'll be no targets. Maybe we need to give you some incentives. And it's a design and build project, which is a challenge for them. So I think, you know, as you say, I think there's, it feels like there's still a lot to to play out in in agency as, as you say, it's, okay, we've decided we're going to do it. Then it's working out how it's going to be done in the processes, like you say, rather than that project plan on a time scale that, that which will actually... You know, eventually, does the house get built in the end just in a different way and, and slightly different, you know, processes and plans that, that result exactly. in the I same mean, result? I mean, if you watch Grand Designs, the houses are normally fantastic at the end of it. They normally go over budget and take two or three years longer than planned. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, we've all seen them, haven't we? Yeah, exactly. yeah. And so some of them don't even get there, do they? They still, um, they're still a part of projects in in many years to come, don't they? And that's uh, where I think agency will go. Some people get it right, and um, a lot of people will get it wrong along the way, I suspect. So moving along a little bit and and thinking about technological changes in in the sector, and you know, we I, and I, and I use the role we in this. Uh, Dale, that um, we've seen the market move, we've seen automotive and how it's evolved, how it's developed through through the years, how dealers have adopted new technology and, and the market has started to shift. I mean, can you think of ways that these technological changes have positively impacted dealers? And on the other, are there any examples where technology has actually hampered them at, in, in the in the sector? Yeah, I mean, I think I think we've jumped forward as an industry. COVID pushed us forward. Um, advantage, though, you've got level playing field in terms of pricing. You've got an opportunity to automate whether people don't add value. You've got an always-on retail offering. And it's definitely changed the way used cars are sold. So I think um, there are some positives on digital. And there are some great data and insight opportunities. And moving forward, I'm sure that AI and chat GPT will have a big impact. So... Um, there are some digital upsides. On the downside, if you're not careful from a pricing perspective, it can be a race to the bottom. And we've gone mad, we've gone digital everywhere. I was listening to a radio program yesterday, and someone was complaining about QR codes in restaurants. It was, I thought it was a good example. 
So if you want to if you want to order a meal in a restaurant in some restaurants, you've got to you've got to scan a QR code and use your mobile, and then you've got to read it on a tiny screen, and you've got to pass your mobile to your children or to someone else who doesn't want a mobile with them. And it doesn't more it's technology or technology say what's wrong with the printed menu? You just pointed it. So I want one of those, please. So I think um, there's a bit of shiny new thing syndrome. And sometimes we're introducing systems that require extra admin from a manager and an employee perspective, which takes the manager and the employee away from the customer. So what I'm what I'm what I'm, I'm preaching at the moment is any any new bit of kit we buy has got to have a benefit for the end user and the user of it, so the employee and the customer. Because I think it's easy to get um, excited about shiny new things that just take your people away from the customer. And is that something that you, I mean, as your role and and, and within Suzuki and and you know, you've you've got that role to play, haven't you? Because there'll be people in your business that will want to be moving very quickly into some of the new technology, really want to implement it, roll it out across the dealer network, get the dealers using it, but you've got to sort of manage that as and when it's right, what do we want for the business, what's right for the dealers, what's right for the customers, and inevitably what's right for Suzuki as well. Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, a bit like agency, um, any new new tech intro introduction is a cultural change. So there's a process change, and cultural change is hard and disruptive. And anyone who's put in place a new DMS knows how disruptive that is to a business. And and people have got to like it and want to do it. There's got to be a benefit to them. So I think um, getting balance is important. And all too often, we ignore the stuff we bought that we're not optimising. We bought last year. We buy something else that we won't optimise if we're not careful. So my first question is, are we optimising? Have we maximised the kit we've already bought? Yeah, it's always the thing, isn't it? I mean, it's how do we create more leads? How do we create more opportunities? And then you've got to ask the question, actually, are you making the most of the opportunities and leads that you're getting already? before we go out and get you more leads and opportunities for you not to do anything with it's that's where you've got this balancing act haven't you with with the dealer network yeah exactly so so so, so i suppose we try and keep it simple we try and talk about lead indicators and lag measures so what are the lead indicators of success let's put our energy into those and what are the things that really matter what are the non-negotiable things and I think I think looking at it's the old 80-20 rule, isn't it? For the 20% of the things are really important, make a big difference. So I always talk about let's move mountains, not kick stones, and focus on the big stuff. And I mean, we we talked about our and your career, how it's you know it's spanned over over the years. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received in the industry, and how well is it tested? you know stood the test of time um you know we talk about all these back to basics you know controllable controller controllable and things like this but for you as del wire i mean what what bit of advice did you receive and and it's it has truly just stood, stood the test of time and proved good question i've got two three for the good question the good question one is every problem you have in business will have two legs it's always the people so you've got those that you're accountable to those are you accountable for and those that you serve. So bosses, employees, and customers. And it's very easy to sit down in your ivory tower and create strategy, but it's going to affect one of those three people, those three stakeholders. So all the problems are people. It's all, always always two legs. And the last one was my predecessor, a guy called David Silver, said, said this to me. You have to listen to this. It's a bit complicated, but I hope it will make He said, not everything that can be counted counts. And not everything that counts can be counted. And that will confuse many an accountant. <laughs> but I think it's important. Not everything that, that can, can be counted matters. And a lot of things that are important can be counted. Does that phrase make sense to you, Philip? I'll do it one more time. Not everything that can be counted counts. Not everything that counts can be counted. Yes. And in my role, partly as an analyst and turning data into useful insight, it's relevant to a degree with that as well, because like you say, it's um, yeah. I think there's a uh, there are things, and this is where you know when you talk about agency, when we talk about trade values and things like this, you know, there's a lot of dynamics in the market. There's an element of data, but it's it's what you do with it, how you use it, what matters. And to your point, what is is 
you know what can you count you know you people leadership skills things like this some of it is just not you know you can't count that can you it's it's, it's something no, that you exactly. need it's soft it's soft skills so i think it's about having some hard measures that you're very very focused on and some soft skills then i'm sure the business is facing the right direction for that no i think i think you know to to finish that on and on, on that i think it'll uh there'll be a lot of people probably uh probably google that and try and get the context behind it but um i'll urge anybody that doesn't um follow dale on on his social channels then then please do because there's always a lot of wise words and and very useful uh words come from dale so i mean as always it's been an absolute pleasure dale chatting to you and and you, you know you and i can talk for hours on on the sector and what should and shouldn't be done but um uh, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for sharing some of your insight and your your wise words on the sector and uh, personally wish you the best for, for 2024. Thank you for you're making me blush now, but thank you very much. Look forward to speaking to you soon. Thank you. Well, thanks for listening to the 59 new series of Insight Report podcasts. We hope you've enjoyed our discussion today and be sure to join us for the next episode. For now, you can read more about what's been discussed today in the Insight Report, which is currently available on the coxautoinc.eu website. So thank you very much, and I will speak to you all soon.